Hosea Williams was a civil rights leader who was deeply committed to the struggle. He was a trusted ally and advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He founded Hosea Feed the Hungry and Homeless as a way of tackling the needs of the less fortunate in his community. And due to his contributions, a street in Atlanta was named after him shortly before his death. I am pleased to be joined in the studio with his daughter, Dr. Barbara Williams Emerson, to talk about the life and legacy of her father. Today, we remember Hosea Williams. He started from very, very humble beginnings. He was born in 1926, just prior to the real depression, and his mother was a single, blind, black young woman in her early 20s who was the daughter of sharecroppers. And she had gotten pregnant in a place called the Macon School for the Colored Blind in Macon, Georgia. So his father was also a, a blind young man. So he started from these beginnings literally dirt poor with a mother who was very disadvantaged who then actually died when he was 10 years old. So he had very little support, parental support. He had very little income. He had access only to the basics of segregated education. He was in a rural setting. So he had a lot of factors that were working against him as a black man and black child in the United States growing up during the Depression. What was it about his upbringing that piqued his interest in community activism? Well, a lot of it had to do with his experiences. He became a champion of the poor, a champion of the person who had no one to speak for, for them. And those were his experiences, in addition to this very poor upbringing, um, farm life as a child. He was also at one point uh, homeless himself because he was a runaway teenager. He was literally run off the farm where he grew up by a mob of angry n white neighbors who were pursuing him because of his inappropriate, in their vision, relationship with another teenager who happened to be a uh, white girl. So he was run off and he was a runaway teenager living on the streets and in the swamps of Florida for several months himself. And he was, that was his experience. And he had several other experiences like that that identified him with the people that he eventually became a champion of. The story you mentioned about him being ostracized for a relationship with a, a white woman. Was that the story at the water fountain after he returned from war, or was that another story? That's another story. That happened when he was probably 15, 16 years old. The water fountain story that you are referring to was when he returned to Georgia from World War II after having fought in Germany and being wounded and spending several months in jail. He was in uniform on his way back to that same farm where he grew up. Uh, he, he changed buses in, um, uh, in a small town in Georgia, actually in Jimmy Carter's hometown. And he was on medication and needed water to take the medicine. And at that time, it was during the height of Jim Crow segregation, and the colored water fountain was broken. So he purchased a cup of coffee and poured the coffee out, and then tried to lean in to the, the door on the white side of the waiting room to get some water from the white fountain. And that was when he was beat and left unconscious, uh, and really left for dead And when the local colored undertaker came to pick him up, they found that he was still alive. So he was in uniform returning from service, wounded in World War II when he was beat nearly to death for transgression of Jim Crow laws to get a cup of water. Wow. Did he ever talk to you about 
how he felt about that experience? Yes, he did. He said that he laid in the hospital after that beating thinking that he had fought on the wrong side. So he was embittered, as were many veterans of World War II who had, had seen a level of social integration and social freedom in Europe that they had not experienced at home and then came back home to the same segregated and oppressive conditions that they'd left felt very much like he had wasted his time and nearly given his life, having fought on the wrong side. Mm. There are probably so many other people who have similar stories like that. Did he share with you any other similar type stories of discrimination that he faced? Well, another uh, situation that he often talked about was during his professional career, he went to uh, Morris Brown College, which is an HBCU in Atlanta, and got a degree in chemistry and took a civil service exam for a job with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and became one of the first research chemists in the South for the Department of Agriculture. And he thought, he said that he thought that he had really made an achievement and that he had made it there. Um, and, but when he got there, he realized how limited his experiences had actually been and his preparation, but he did remedial um, work with one of the other chemists there. But he eventually came to realize that he was sort of the spook who sat by the door, the token, and that when other blacks came to tr try to get work at the lab where he was working, he was, he was always put up as the one, well, we have Jose Williams. So he was not only discriminated against in terms of his inability to move in terms of his mobility in his job, but he saw himself as being a barrier being put in the face of other blacks who came for any kind of job, menial or otherwise. Mm. Make the connection to the Southern Leadership Christian Council and his relationship with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Okay. He worked for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference for several years, and that came about based upon his role in the local civil rights movement in Savannah, Georgia, where he worked for the Department of Agriculture. And he became interested and involved um, in an incident that he attributes his involvement there to was um, having gotten this middle class mobility to, an, to the extent of having a good salary that afforded him the ability to purchase a nice home, build, build a new home for his family, and to have new automobiles and live a middle class lifestyle that one of the things that they would do on Sundays that was that he would take my two little brothers and they would go to a drug store that had a, what's called, was called then a soda fountain and get ice cream and that would be part of the Sunday um, treat for dessert. And it was one, one of those places that had stools that you could sit on at the counter. And this particular Sunday, there were several children spinning around on the stools, and the boys wanted to do the same thing. And he said it was very disturbing to him that he had to, given all of his success and all of his hopes and dreams for his children, that he had to tell his boys that they could not engage in something as simple as what those other children were doing. And that that was devastating to him that he realized that no matter what his achievements had been, that the future of his children were limited by these laws. So he then became involved in the local movement in Savannah through the NAACP and was actually rejected, ejected from the NAACP because of his militancy and his thoughts of taking on nonviolent direct action, which was not what was on the agenda at that time. And so he organized a group of young people in Savannah um, under the banner of an organization called the Chatham County Crusade for Voters. 
and they took to the streets in much the fashion of what was going on in several other places in the South, such as Birmingham, and did direct action demonstrations. And he was arrested there and spent 39 days in jail in Savannah during the summer of 63. That was when um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference sent in, as they would in local situations, send in staff members to provide technical support and to do nonviolent training. So it was because of the success of the movement that he led in Savannah that he became uh, engaged with Dr. King, and Dr. King asked him to come to Atlanta from Savannah at the in the summer of 64 to work there for a year doing voter registration and political education. And it was supposed to, so he took a lab, uh, he took a leave from the lab in Savannah from the Department of Agriculture, it was supposed to be for one year, but he never went back. He became fully part, fully and full time engaged in the civil rights movement from there. During his time with Dr. King, did he describe his relationship with Dr. King and his thoughts and feelings about how Dr. King was viewed. I know that your father passed away in 2000? Yes. And so he was around a lot longer after Dr. King had passed away. Um, did he share any thoughts about the man? Well, he sincerely loved Dr. King, and the way he expressed it was that he, Dr. King was not his god, but he did not know God until he met Dr. King. <laughs> and so he was very much a comrade of Dr. King's. He was a friend. And he served a, a role for Dr. King that others did not. Dr. King used to call Hosea Williams his Castro. And that was meant that he, his role was to be the agitator, to be the grassroots person, to be the person who could take a field staff of young men and women into a community that had already decided they wanted to do something about the local situation and provide them with the tactical support and the organizing support and the encouragement to mount a local movement and to literally turn people out into the streets with the goal of filling up the jails in that community in order to bring about a level of pressure that would then put them in a position for negotiating demands. And the person who would come in to do the negotiating would usually be Andrew Young. And then Dr. King's role was to heighten the community's awareness and the community's participation and with the long, with the overall goal of being addressing and redressing conditions in the local community. Much has, well, it's not in recent time, there always seems to be a discussion about the state and the advancement of African Americans over a period of time, over history. And usually when I hear that commentary, it usually stops there. And the answer to the question is always African Americans have made tremendous strides, but we're not there yet. We have not reached full equality. If I could pose the question to you with your history and knowledge of the civil rights movement and the advancement of African Americans over time, what should be done? If we're not quite there yet, what needs to happen to get us there? I think what needs to happen to get us there is that we need to revisit the type of unity that was brought about by the civil rights movement. I think what has happened is that a certain number of us have been able to make advances personally, professionally, economically. So now we've got a structure, a social structure in the African American community that reflects the social structure of the larger American community. So we have a small number of, we've got a 1% We've got a 99% as well. And I think that's where the issue is, is that the development of the talents, almost in a Du Bois sense of the, the talented 10th, well, we've got to develop the untalented 10th because we are not moving 
along at a pace where everyone can keep up. So happy you said that because as a young person, young as African American, um, I've experienced a lot of the comments from elders within the community. I made it, you have to make it, and you do it on your own, kiddo. You work hard, uh, and no matter how far I've gotten, the idea that people sort of look back and pick people up as they rise doesn't seem to be all too common. I was watching a documentary, CNN Black in America, mm -hmm. and someone in the film said, you know, a lot of black people don't help each other. Why is that? Why is it that we don't help each other? Especially young people when there are senior members in the community who have um, worked hard in their lives and yes, they've achieved success. The notion of looking back and sort of reaching up and, and finding someone, whether it's a young mentee or giving young African Americans opportunities to get their foot in the door, that doesn't seem in my generation to be something that my uh, friends and I are all too familiar with that you're not experiencing it, right. which is very unfortunate because we're all standing on someone else's shoulders. And I think it is important for people of my generation. I think that's one of the ways where we have let your generation down, is that we opened the doors, walked through the doors, and then assumed that the people behind us would be coming through those doors as well. Well, it, it essentially, we opened the doors, walked through, and the doors started to close again behind us, but we didn't look back to see that the doors behind us were closing. So I think it is incumbent upon those of us who have the ability to help others do so. But it also requires a willingness on young people to listen to what the old heads have to say. <laughs> you have a message for young people about the story and legacy of your father. What is that? It's what you said at the very beginning, and it's that your circumstances don't determine your destiny. I think his life is an, a living, a, well, was a living example of that, and it's one of the reasons why I continue to try to tell his story. Because as I said in the very beginning, that we're talking about someone who was born during the Depression to a blind black girl who was the daughter of sharecroppers who died when he was 10, but went on to become not only a civil rights leader, but a research chemist, but the founder of an organization in Atlanta called Hosea Feed the Hungry and Homeless, where we fed up to 20,000 people in a day and have been doing it for 40 years. And that's his living legacy. So if that little boy who was born in southwest Georgia on a farm, dirt poor, could become an international leader and the leader of an organization that helps people every day, that's a lesson that his beginnings did not determine where he ended up, and neither does anyone else's. What do you think people would be surprised to know the most about your dad? I think people would be surprised by his sense of humor and his, he cracked himself up all the time. And he once said that he would like to have been a stand-up comedian. So he really did uh, like humor and he liked it, I think, because of its ability to make people laugh and people to smile. And he really did love people, genuinely. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream. What was your father's dream? Well, you know, what Hosea Williams took up from Dr. King, Dr. we all know Dr. King had a dream, and he said, I have a dream. But what he also said was that what he wanted to be remembered for was not his Nobel Peace Prize or his degrees 
or the many awards that he'd received. Dr. King said what he wanted to be remembered for as he was eulogized was that he fed the hungry, clothed the naked. So Hosea took that part of Dr. King's mandate of feeding the hungry as his dream and created the organization Hosea Feed the Hungry and Homeless. So I think if he had a dream, it would have been to come to a point where his work, his organization was no longer needed, where we did not have in a country of affluence, for instance, in the city of Atlanta, 35,000 homeless people every night who have nowhere to sleep and who have nothing to eat. And the uh, the majority of those 35,000 people being um, children, 3,500 people being, being children. So I think that would have been his dream was an America in which all children and families had sufficient income for the basics of housing, food, and being a family being able to take care of itself on its own through its own efforts, which means that there would need to be jobs. <laughs> and we need a lot of those. <laughs> we need a lot of those. And see, a lot of people forget that when Dr. King was assassinated, we were in the process of organizing, which in today's term was an occupation of Washington uh, the Poor People's Campaign, which occupied the uh, mall in Washington with Resurrection City, which was a tent city built that brought people from across the country of all races to Washington to demand an equal and sufficient living wage, which is something that we are yet to accomplish. Mm, yeah. We have a lot of work to do as a country. It's been said by a lot of African-American pillars of the community that education is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. Do you agree with that? And if you don't, what is the issue, the civil rights issue of the 21st century? I agree with it to a, to a degree, but it's not education in the sense of providing just access to education. It's education in the sense of preparing people to take on roles that are needed within the society, both from a technological as well as a sociological point of view. Because education itself is, of course, a benefit, it's a value but it has to also be connected to a utilitarian need. And again, it gets back to the economics of it, which is jobs. And I don't think that education without having the benefit, I have a niece who just graduated um, from college and I made that point to her and she says, well, what's the point of education without a job? Well, there are many points to education, but one of them should be the ability to take your education and apply it in a meaningful way that will provide you with the income to provide for you and your family. So I don't think it's just education. I think it's education in an economic environment where that education is going to be productive in a livelihood. And does that climate exist now? No, because we don't have jobs for young people who are graduating. We have young people graduating in mountains of student loans, with a mountain of student loans, and without the ability to get jobs to bring down those student loans. So we're setting up a situation where people are starting, who are people with advantage are now starting their lives at a disadvantage. People with privilege are now starting their lives at a disadvantage. So if those young people cannot realize their dream, having gotten an education, then what on earth is going to happen to the young people who haven't had the, the educational opportunity? Hmm. So we're creating a two-tier level of disadvantage now, the privileged disadvantage and the underprivileged disadvantage. Mm, that's a new interesting way of looking at it that I didn't before think about 
uh, as people hopefully rise up the ladder and become more successful, you normally see special education as a way of getting out right. of poverty, not just for you, but for a generation, for you and your, your kids. And um, if we have this sort of permanent underclass, then that seems to be a detriment and somewhat of a curse to your generational legacy that you won't be able to bring them up even though you worked hard and got your education and did everything you're supposed to do. And it's eventually, unless we turn the tide, is going to become a disincentive for young people to go to put forth the effort as well as for parents to put out the, to put out the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, the American way has been that you work hard, you go to school, and then you get a job so that you can then provide a better level of lifestyle for your family than your parents were able to provide for you. But we're now facing, for the first time, a generation of young people who will not do better than their parents. And I think that will eventually become a disincentive because we long ago fell behind in keeping young people stimulated intellectually enough to keep them in school. The carrot was always the economic advancement. So if we're not providing the intellectual engagement to keep them in school, nor the economic advantage of, a, of gainful employment, many young people are going to say, well, why should I bother? Mm. You know, and that's, that really is a sad situation. Dr. Emerson, I could talk to you for another two hours, um, but I'm out of time. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to thank you for coming into the studio. Um, used to doing a lot of interviews over the phone, so much so that when people come into the studio, I really don't know how to act. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do with myself now. But uh, I thank you for uh, putting in the effort and the time to come, and uh, it is greatly appreciated. Well, it's been a pleasure to be here and to be back at the new school. Yes, you, know, you served as is, the vice president. Yes, I college. was vice president for program development here at the new school of up through 2000. As a matter of fact, I left the new school just before my father passed away to go and be with him in his last, in his last few months. So coming back to the new school is really a homecoming for me. It was an, in my career, the time that I spent at the new school was the most fun I had on a job. Interesting. So in that case, to end the interview, I'll just say, welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. This is Roy Paul with WNSR New School Radio.